Well, good morning, all of you. <laughs> um, uh, just turning your Bibles to uh, Isaiah 65, where we will find this morning the dangers of pride and the blessings of humility. Uh, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That is really his message uh, all throughout Scripture. Uh, Jesus said that blessed is the poor in spirit, uh, for they will receive the kingdom of heaven. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the, the meek or the, the gentle or the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Now we hear those words and, and, and uh, we would even claim to believe it, but uh, sometimes it's hard for us to act out on that. Sometimes it's, it's uh, in, this, in this age, in this world where it's dog, it's dog, and you need to assert yourself. If you want to accomplish something, you need to stand up and, and, and take it, really. And so we often find ourselves that uh, we, 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 we hear this and we want to believe this, but we are not always practicing it or not always sure of it. Uh, and so this morning, if you have been walking in humility, then there's, this is a great word for you this morning. And if you have not been walking in humility, then this would be a great reprimand and a reminder to you that it's the humble that God will bless, the humble that He will, that will inherit uh, the earth. Uh, uh, and and when, so, so it becomes important to us to, to know who... Does God consider to be humble? Who are the humble? What is humility, really, is, is the question. What is God's definition of, of humility? And, and there's a number of great passages that we can go to, but I want to summarize it really in one word, apart from humility. But humility equals, equals obedience. It's when you humble yourself, I am not going to do it my way, but I will do it God's way. I will not follow my thinking, my word, but I will follow God's thinking and God's word. That's really what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is someone who disciplines themselves to follow the teachings and the life of of, its, uh, of, of his or hers uh, teacher or master. In our case, who, is, who are Christians, we follow Christ. We submit ourselves to him and his, his teaching. Uh, and, and really, the, uh, later on in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 66, verse 2, we read here that uh, the, the one who is humble and contrite of spirit is the one really who trembles at the word of God, who, who really fears God and fears his word, that when he, when he obeys it, there's, there's joy, but when he disobeys, there is actually trembling. There is fear. There is, I, I, I hate disappointing. I hate going against the Lord. Uh, the humble is, is, is the blessed man of Psalm 1. Uh, it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but who delights himself in the Lord. And, and, and uh, uh, meditate in the scriptures, meditate in the law of the Lord all day. And so we find this, this, this description that the humble are those who trust God, who believes Him, who takes Him at His word, and the proud are those who resist Him, those who refuse to obey Him, those to, who say, I will do it, but Frank Sinatra, my way. Uh, singing that merrily on the way to, to hell. Uh, and so uh, the Lord is, is, is against the proud. He, 
has destined the proud to wrath. Uh, Proverbs 6 tells us that uh, those with haughty eyes, those with, with, who are prideful, who, are, who consider themselves elevated, exalted above others, it is an abomination to God. It is repulsive to Him. Uh, Isaiah 13 verse 11 says, Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. And so here we come now this morning in Isaiah 65, the second last chapter of Isaiah. Uh, and really, Isaiah 65 and 66 forms one unit, and it is God's answer. God answers the prayer that we've been studying for the number of weeks before the prayer of the intercessor. And really, the final word of, of God to Israel, to, to Judah, is that he will give wrath to the wicked, but blessing to his servants. Uh, he will give grace to the humble, but uh, he will oppose the proud. Uh, now, just, just by way of reminder, just going a quick overview of, of Isaiah, what we've seen, the first 39 chapters we saw uh, Israel really... Uh, being proudful, a leader is not willing to submit to the word, not trusting God, wanting to do things in their own way, wanting to find solutions, their own solutions to their problems, uh, and finally God judgment. So the first 39 chapters really of, of uh, Isaiah is about God's judgment interspersed with a few blessings sprinkled here and there. Uh, and God's solution really to that was, to, was the promised Messiah. The, the, a son will be born to us, a, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, uh, who will come and he will restore. He's the one who will lead the nation of Israel living in righteousness and justice and therefore peace. Then the second half of, of Isaiah chapters 40 to 66, the main theme there is comfort, comfort and salvation, that God has promised that he will save his people from their sins, save them first of all from, from uh, exile in Babylon, uh, but also uh, from their sin. And we, and we saw those great passages about the servant, the servant that will come and who will establish the word of God throughout the earth, the servant who will be a, a, a covenant to the nations, a, a light to the Gentiles. And then, of course, we saw the, the Spirit-anointed one that was going to come uh, with a message of the gospel, that he was he come to preach the good news, um, that he uh, will intercede for his people, and that he will execute vengeance on those who would not bow the knee before God. And part of his intercessory ministry, we saw, was his appointed intercessors, those who would pray for the nation that they would, uh, that God would uh, really fulfill the works that he promised. That's the whole idea. They were, were to, to remind God of his own word. That they, don't, they didn't claim anything for themselves, but they were merely appealing to the Lord that he would fulfill what he already said he would do. And so we, we saw them recalling the loving kindnesses that God has showed him in chapter 30, uh, 63, that they were calling God to look down on their on their on their status, on their, on their condition and how they were suffering and really confessing their sin as well. And then they were calling God to actually come down. As Lord, if only if you would come down, then things would be different. Um, again, confessing their sin and pleading Him not to forget about them not to abandon them, not to forsake them. And then uh, at the end of uh, chapter 64, verse Verse 12, we, we read really these, these haunting words, this last phrase, will you keep silent and afflict us beyond measure? Uh, will you be silent, Lord? Uh, and this morning we will read from verse 1 of chapter 65, uh, God's answer 
to that to that question. And as I, I'm going to read the whole chapter, and so if you can follow along in your Bible, just pre- please note first of all a couple of things. Just the personal pronouns that are used here. Nine of them, just in the first word, uh, first verse about God. This is God speaking. This is God revealing His mind to us. This is this is things that we can know about Him that otherwise we would not have known unless he has revealed it to us. And then secondly, and this is more of a background issue, is I believe that this answer to prayer, we would see really come to fulfillment uh, probably at the end of the, of the tribulation period. Um, now, again, just a quick review. Remember, we are in the church age now. Uh, Christ has come. He's, 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 he's paid uh, for our sin on the cross. He's uh, ascended to, to heaven. Uh, now is the church age. The next thing on the, on the eschatology uh, calendar, so to speak, is, is, the, is the rapture of the church uh, and the tribulation, the seven-year period of, of God's wrath being poured out on earth. And really towards the end of the tribulation, I believe this is when this prayer would probably, this prayer has been prayed since Isaiah wrote it, but at that time will be prayed most fervently. And it's also at that time towards the end of tribulation that the Lord would answer them. Because at the end of chapter 65, we read of the new heavens and the new earth um, that we will expound a little bit more later on. So let me read chapter 65 for us, Isaiah 65. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I to a nation which did not call on my name. I've spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts, a people who continually provoked me to my face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks, who sit among graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine flesh and the broth of unclean meat is in their pots who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. And I will even repay into their bosom both their own iniquities and the iniquities of their fathers together, says the Lord, because they have burned incense on the mountains and scorned me on the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. Verse 8, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for there is benefit in it. So I will act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and an heir of my mountain from Judah. Even my chosen ones shall inherit it. My servants will dwell there. Sharon will be a pasture land for flocks and the valley of Achor a resting place for herds. For my people who seek me But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune and fill cups with mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword. And all of you will bow down to the slaughter because I called, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not hear. And you did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight." Verse 13, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my servants will eat, but you will be hungry. Behold, my servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. Behold, my servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. Behold, my servants will shout joyfully with a glad heart, but you will cry out with a heavy heart, and you will wail with a broken spirit. You will leave you your name for a curse to my chosen ones and the Lord God will slay you 
but my servants will be called by another name because he who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth and he who swears in the earth will swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my sight. Verse 17, For behold, I create a new heavens and new earth and the former things I will not uh, will not uh, be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and a people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives uh, but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will build and another they will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. And my chosen ones will, will wear out the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will uh, do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word, your word that is always timely, always relevant, always true. And Father, we pray this morning that you would speak to us through this passage this morning, a passage that speaks to those who are faithful, those who are humble, those who heed your word and follow your ways that you will bless them. And those, Lord, who follow their own ways, who have not bowed the knee before you and resist you, Lord, for them you have destined wrath and judgment. And Father, so help us that we would, as we hear your word and as we see your dealings with the nation Israel, that we would consider ourselves, consider our own lives, and that your spirit, Lord, would minister to us um, your truth, Lord, and bring encouragement, Lord, to hearts that are in need of encouragement and conviction, Lord, to hearts that are hardened and in need of conviction so that your name would be glorified this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask. Amen. And so really the first few seven verses deals with uh, the wrath of God that will come down on, on the proud. Uh, verse 1 we see really here uh, uh, God's predicted plan, he's, uh, a plan that he's prophesied. Uh, and the question really for us in verse 1 is, who is he addressing here? Who is he referencing? Who, is, who are these people that have not asked for the Lord, that have not sought him, uh, that have not called on his name? And, and some say, well, it is Israel. Uh, this this must be this must be Israel, and it is written in this way because uh, they did not call on the Lord with sincerity. Uh, and uh, for me, I, I find that uh, difficult to to reconcile with actually what the text says. The sincerity is not really. In this text, it clearly says that God permitted him to be sought by those who did not ask for him, to be found by those who did not seek him. Although he was saying, here am I, here am I, they did not call on his name. And, and um, I believe this is actually speaking to the Gentiles. This is a reference to the Gentiles where, where God is predicting that at a coming future, uh, Israel would... would uh, uh, 
fall away in a sense, uh, uh, not, not walking with, with God, but that he will extend his, his plan and purposes, which he already revealed to us before in Isaiah, that they are included in his plans and purposes uh, in chapter 2, in chapter 10, in chapter 19, chapter 42, 49, 60, and there may be others that I've overlooked, but all referring to Gentiles that will come to to the Lord, to worship Him. And so this is a reference, I believe, to Gentiles. And, and I think a compelling evidence for that is that the word nation that's used in, in verse 1 is the word goi in, in, in Hebrew, which is normally uh, referring to a Gentile nation. Only occasionally it refers to the covenant people, but usually in a very derogative way. And so here he says, it's the goi who does not call on my name. And of course, we know that is true. Israel has always called on the name of the Lord, although it's true that not always in sincerity, but they have been brought into existence by God. And so from the very start of, of the nation, they knew God and they uh, walked with God and God revealed himself to them. Uh, and so here Paul was saying that, that uh, Paul actually... Uh, quoted these verses in, 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 in Romans chapter 10 when he says there in verse, verse 20, and Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all day long I stretch out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. And so Paul applies this to the Gentiles coming into the, the kingdom plans and, and promises of God. And Paul says Isaiah was bold, and he was bold. You have to consider that he's writing this in response to those who were suffering, those who were crying out to God, and, God, and he's basically saying to them, listen, God is not absent. He's judging you. God is not hard of hearing. You are hard of heart. That's why you are suffering. Yes, he has revealed himself to you, but you have rebelled against him. He has shown your, his ways to you, but you have shunned him, you have scorned him, you have spurned him. That's why he's not silent. He's judging you. The ways that you have been following is odious to the God. He's saying it provoked him or provokes him to wrath. And he says, All day long I have held out my hands to you to come to, to worship me, to follow me, to follow my ways. But they have rebelled, they have resisted, they have refused. Not once, not twice, ongoingly, continually, characteristically. And that's really what the Hebrew tries to bring out here in, in the original language is that God holds out his hand and then he goes and he says, but you provoked me continually. How did they provoke him? By false worship, by, by, by idolatry, by worshiping uh, other gods. By continually provoking me to the face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks. Uh, they were, uh, early on in Isaiah chapter 1, we, we read that they uh, inflamed themselves among, among the oaks. And, and really, uh, they had uh, these lush gardens in, through, in which they, they offer up worship to, to the, the false gods of that time. They were burning in incense on bricks, uh, really, uh, apart from the fact that they did it to a false god, God's commandment was that any altar that, that was built uh, in order to bring sacrifices to him were to be built on hewed stones, not bricks. And so even in something small as that, what we would think is like insignificant, God takes very serious. He takes his word very seriously. And so they provoked him to anger continually by their false worship. They've provoked him continually by seeking revelation, seeking guidance elsewhere. From sources other than God. Here we see they practice necromancy, which really is they were seeking the dead for guidance. That's why they were in the, in, uh, among the graves and spent the night in secret places. Uh, 
A, a clear violation of what God commanded them to do. That they sh there should be no one among them who practices divination or witchcraft or interprets omens or sorcerers, those who cast spells or mediums or spiritists, no one who ca calls up the dead. Whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord, Deuteronomy 18 tells us. And so they, God said, don't do this. Israel said, we will. God said, follow my word. Come to me if you want guidance. Come to me if you want revelation. They said, no, we will find our own way. We will look to other gods, other, other means. They were flaunting his, his dietary laws, dietary laws that was for their own good. They ate swine flesh and, and unclean animals. Um, of course, that's one of the most well-known things we know about the Jewish people is that no, they're not allowed to eat pork, so bacon is out. Uh, and it probably reminds us of, of a little bit of probably what, uh, what Eve experienced when, in the garden when she saw that the, the fruit was good to eat and, and de delight to the eye and would, would make me wise. And so... Probably the Jews saw a nice bacon butty and they ate it, uh, but against God's, God's commandments. Uh, they, were, they provoked God by their spiritual pride, who says, keep to yourself and do not come near me, for I am holier than thou. Have you, you've all heard that expression. This is where it comes from. Uh, they were thinking they were better. They were thinking we are God's people. We have been set apart, forgetting they were set apart for service, set apart to humbly serve their God. But because of the, 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 the laws that, that really made them different from all other nations, that became a, a source of, of, of pride to them. Their pride was like smoke in God's eyes, annoying him, irritating him, burning his eyes. And not occasionally, all the day, ongoingly, characteristically, God holds up his, had his hands to them and says, come, come to me. Christ does the same. All who are weary and heavy laden. And what do people do? No, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this. I will, I will sort it myself. I will, I will trust in my own resources. I will trust in my friends and family. And they forsake God. And then when they come through, they have great reason to be prideful, or so they think. And that's what we need to remember. That our pride, the fact that we have the scriptures, the fact that you know the gospel, should never be a source of pride. That, I, that we are better than those out there who don't know. The unbelievers, the idolaters, the fornicators, all, you name them. We are called to humbly serve the Lord by going to them and calling them to repentance. Not looking down on them from an elevated position. And so every time that we hear God's word and we don't obey him, we think we will do it our way. Our way is better. 
But we can think of we can think of many occasions. Just think of, of for instance, decision making. If you need to make a big decision, do you consult God? Do you come to His Word to see is that how will my decision? What does God has to say about it? What principles apply to my situation that I can take? Do I seek godly wisdom from those who know scriptures and, and who walks in his ways? Or do I follow my own way? Or even worse, go from counselor to counselor to counselor until I get one who tells me what I want to hear? That's pride. And it's offensive to God. It's smoke in his eyes. And therefore the Lord, verse 6 and 7, says, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. He's saying, I'm not silent, I'm judging you. Your affliction is my answer to your provocation. I'm repaying you for your deeds, your iniquities. And uh, here it says the iniquities of their fathers as well. Now, we understand that each man is guilty of for his own sin. God does not punish us for the sins of our fathers. And here what he's saying is, is that because of their fathers, and what happens is the influence of that is they've walked in rebellion, and that's passed on to their children and to their children. And so God will judge all of that. by bringing what they were looking on them, for on themselves because they have burned incense on the mountains. They have not come to him. They have not worshipped him. They've scorned him. And so I will measure their former work into their bosom. This is personal. This is individual. This is not collectively. And again, we, we, we can only look at ourselves and, and say, is this true of us? And I'm not talking about occasionally when we fall in sin or in pride and fall in, in disobedience. I'm talking about continually, persistently, habitually, characteristically, not following God, not coming to Him, not honoring Him, not worshiping Him. When we are devoted to other things more than we are devoted to the Lord. Other causes, other, other ambitions, our own agenda above God's agenda. When we come and we think that we know better than God. That we say, well, I, I mean, that's, Scripture clearly says that, but surely that's not for today. Surely that's not what is meant. And we start reinterpreting Scripture, ignoring Scripture. Smoke in his eyes. When we start selecting what we will and will not receive and obey, believe and obey. Smoke in his eyes. When we exalt ourselves because of our knowledge, because of our salvation by grace, nothing we've done to deserve it. To be proud of that smoke in his eyes, it provokes him. And so for the, for the, for the proud, God destines wrath, punishment. But for the humble, he only has blessings. He only has grace. Verse 8 says, as, a, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for there is benefit in it. So I will act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. And so the picture here is you find a cluster of grapes and, and most of them are bad, but they are one or two good ones. And just because of that, God will not discard the, 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 the cluster of grapes. 
but he will preserve, he will save those few grapes that are faithful to him. Those who are his servants, those who are his servants are those who humble themselves before him in obedience, in doing what he called them to do, what he saved them to do. He said, not all of my people are like that. Uh, there is a remnant. Uh, there always will be a remnant. There always was a remnant. A remnant who is faithful to the Lord uh, that ensure that Israel survives so that God's plans and purposes, His word, His promises will come to uh, fruition. He talks there about, even my chosen ones shall inherit it and my servants will dwell there. Really, these chosen ones in this context is, is Israel. This is, we normally think, when we think of chosen ones in elect, we may think of the church. Well, over here, what he's referring to is, is the chosen ones in Israel. They will be preserved. As I said, the church will be raptured before the tribulation. And so really, uh, in, 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 uh, maybe if you can flip over to, to Matthew 24 quickly, uh, verse 29. Uh, here it says, but immediately... After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. And these, these, these tribes, I believe, is, is referencing the tribes of Israel. Um, the church is gone. If my understanding of Scripture is correct, the church will be already raptured. We are not in the tribulation, but after this tribulation, towards the end of the tribulation, when Christ returns, that He will, he will gather the really the 144,000 that we read of in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. Those evangelists, Jewish evangelists that went and proclaimed the gospel. And so them and, and those who are converts, they will come. They will be gathered in at that time. So God will preserve, even through the tribulation period, a remnant, a faithful remnant of people that will still believe Him, still trust in Him, even though wrath is falling down on earth. And they will be brought into the land that will be Blessed. It talks today about Sharon. Sharon is really, there's, there's two geographical uh, locations that it could refer to. One is a coastal plain from Caesarea up to Joppa, uh, which is a very fertile area. Or the one other area is east of the, the Jordan River that was given to the tribe of Gad. Um, we don't know exactly which one, but uh, it's uh, the Valley of Achor is the Valley of Trouble. This was where you may remember when when uh, when Achan disobeyed God by taking uh, booty from Jericho, that he and his family was stoned in the Valley of Trouble, the Valley of Achor. Uh, near near Jericho. Now, why are these places mentioned? I don't know exactly why 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 these places are chosen, but for certainly it, it tells us that these were physical places. These were real places. The the places that the people will whose chosen ones will be gathered to is a real physical place. The place of Israel, where we can see it clearly. Then verse eleven and twelve. But you forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune and the cups with mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword. 
So, but you have forsake the Lord. You have not reckoned with the Lord. You thought you can live without me. You have rejected my word and my will and my ways. You forgot my holy mountain. That is the place of worship the, where the temple was situated. Those of you who rather would worship in the gardens than me as I prescribed. You will indulge in idolatry, serving the gods of, of fortune and fate. Really, the destiny uh, in the Hebrew is fate, You're where you will hopefully end up with. They did not look to God for provision, for uh, prosperity. They forgot the promises, the Mosaic promises that was part of the Mosaic Covenant, that if you obey the Lord, He will bless you. And they said, no, we will seek the God of fortune and the God of faith. They will bless us. They will prosper us. And God said, the only thing that, they, that, that will result in is that you are destined for the sword. You are destined for a violent death. You will be slaughtered by the sword. Why? Because of your pride, if I may summarize it. Because I called and you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not hear. And you did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. Is God calling you this morning? Is there something that you know that you should be doing? Or maybe something that you know you are not following God's way, not following God's will, and He's calling you this morning? And He's speaking to you this morning? Will you answer Him? Will you not listen to him? Will you stop doing the evil that abhors him? And do what delights him? <coughs> but because they did not heed God's word and they did not follow his ways, they were destined for slaughter. And really verses 13 to 16, we see this, this stark contrast between those who humbly follow and serve the Lord, his servants, and those who don't. Uh, behold, repeat it over and over again. Take note, beware. There is no middle ground. <coughs> Take note the final destiny of those who refuse to come, refuse to heal, refuse to humble themselves before the Lord. My servants will eat, but you will be hungry. My servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. My servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. My servants will shout joyfully with a glad heart, but you will cry out with a heavy heart, and you will wail with a broken spirit. And you will leave your name for a curse to my chosen ones. This is really when, 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 when you are used or what has happened to you is used as a curse or in the, in the form of a curse. So for instance, uh, you remember Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? It is like, hey, listen, if you do this, you will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. That would be pronouncing a curse really on someone who is like that or the same thing will happen to you as what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and so what he's saying here is, is that those who refuse to hear the Lord, who refuse to bow to Him, who refuse to serve Him, their name will be like a curse. 
people would say, oh, you remember those who were disobedient, who were proud. This is what you will be like. This, they use it as a curse. And my servants will be called by another name. Uh, really a new name. We, we're not sure what that new name is, another name is. Uh, we know that in Revelations, he talks about Revelation 3.20 to the church of Philadelphia. The promise is given that for those who overcome, they will receive a new name that, or the, the name of God will be written on them and they will receive the name of Christ. And he goes and he says, all those that are blessed are blessed by the God of truth. Literally, the God of Amen. When it, when if, if it goes well, it's because God blessed you. And if you, if you swear, if you give your word, it's because of you swear by the God of truth. You can, your word can be trusted. There's no falsehood, no deception, no hypocrisy. And then we come to verses 17 to 25. Uh, this, this wonderful, blessed future for the humble. Um, for behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Now, when will this take place? I think most of us or believers, many believers, when as soon as they read new heavens and new earth, our mind jumps immediately to Revelation 21, 22, and we think, ah, the eternal state. It, it, it's, it's right at the end. That's when God will create a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, and we read in, in, in Revelations um, 21 uh, that uh, there will be no more sin, that God will be among his people, verses uh, 3. I mean, you, you can turn there if you wish in, in Revelation. I'm not going to read, the, but uh, just for, for referencing purposes, Revelation 21. Uh, there will be no more sin because God will be among his people. And when God's there, it means perfect righteousness. Um, no more crying, no more pain. There will be no more cowards or unbelievers, no more abhorrent or detestable or abominations, no more murderers or immoral people, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. Really a place of pristine perfection, free from any corruption. That is the eternal state. That is the heaven, new heavens and the earth at the end of time. But what is described here uh, is, is different. What we, what's described here, there are similarities, but there's also some very prominent differences. Uh, here we see that uh, really the heavens and the earth will be, if I can put it that way, a, a place of blessed amnesia. A place where you will forget all the bad things, the, or at least not remember the, the, the pain and the hurt of the bad things. Verse 17, the former things, uh, these are the, 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 the things of judgment, the things of, of God's wrath. Uh, if you think of, of the tribulation period, all of those things would be not come to mind anymore. They would be no longer be remembered. Verse 18 and 19, it will be a place of, of great joy that uh, God has created Jerusalem for rejoicing, for gladness, and He will rejoice in His people. There will be no longer uh, the sound of crying. But verse 20, we read that the, there is still death. And so this cannot refer to the eternal state. This cannot be the final heavens and earth, new heavens and new earth. No longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. So there will be no more infant deaths, no more deaths in the prime of life. 
those who die early will actually be thought of as being under a curse. They must have sinned grievously for God to judge them with an early death. And those who, who died a hundred years, that will be considered an infant death, an early death. Uh, verse, 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 uh, verse, verse 22, sort of midway, it says, For the lifetime of a tree, for as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people. People will get very old. Even in our day, uh, I read that in 2013, they've discovered a, 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 uh, a bristlecone pine in California, which they estimated to be at 4,848 4, years old. They've actually discovered another one that's about 5,000 years old, but they immediately named this tree Methuselah, of course, after... Methuselah, who, who reached the age of 969 years uh, in Genesis before the flood. And so it would seem that this, this would be a time where, where there's some radical changes that happens on the earth, that there is still death, but grace greatly reduced. People will reach incredible ages. They will be very old. And it will be a place of prosperity and abundance and success. Verses 21 says, They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit, as is so often the case. They will not plant and another eat. They will not labor in vain, verse 23, or bear children for calamity. Verse 24 says that it will be a, a place of incredible close communion with God. They will, they, they will be still busy praying and God will answer. Why? Because they will pray for God's kingdom and God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as they pray, God will do it. A great place of peace free from danger, free from, from harm, where the wolf and the lamb will graze together. The lamb and, will eat straw like the ox, and the dust will be the serpent's food. And there will be no evil or harm in my holy mountain, says the Lord. We often, we often, we often say it's the lion and the lamb lying together. No, it's the lion and the wolf lying together. Uh, the lion eats, uh, not the lion, the, the lamb and the wolf lying together, and, and the, the lion, man, I'm confused. <laughs> the wolf and the lamb to lying together, and the lion eating uh, straw like an ox. But note, the curse is still in play. The serpent still eats dust. In Genesis 3, the serpent was cursed. Uh, more than all the cattle and all the animals of the field, and you will go on your belly, you will slide on your belly, and you will eat dust for your food. Dust will be your meat, really, is, is, is the Hebrew. And so the curse is still, the curse has not been totally lifted. The curse is not completely over. Re severely restricted, but not over. And of course, with with the election just passed and all the talk about the environment and climate change and, and policies. and uh, If some of the Greens and the environmentalists will just love the Word of God and follow the Word of God, they would love this place. The wolf and the lamb would be together and there would be no more animal cruelty and And this is, when, when will this be then, if it's not the eternal state? I believe this is the millennial kingdom that, 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 is, that is referred to here. Um, that when the time when Christ comes back uh, with us to establish his kingdom on earth, 
And we've already read a number of times throughout Isaiah of the fantastic changes that will take place on earth. Uh, physical changes, changes in nature. Uh, after, of course, incredible damage has been done to the earth through, through the wrath of God. Um, and we, this will be the time when the Messiah, when the servant, when the, the Spirit anointed one will establish their kingdom in righteousness and justice. And because of that, there's peace. And I think this, to understand this is, so why is it called the new heavens and a new earth? I think to understand this, and listen, this is just my view on this. Uh, I think it's, it's the similar to, to when we come to salvation. When we as believers, when you come to Christ, when you believe Jesus Christ for who he claims to be and what he has done, and you come repentant of your sin, believing in him and him alone for salvation, then we are told that we are made new. We are a new creature. The old things have passed away, behold, the new has come. But you and I know, yes, we knew, but we're not totally new. Our heart has been changed, our heart has been, we've been given a new heart, we desire new things, and we are gradually changing to become more like the one who saved us, more like Christ. But we still have this, this law in us that, that competes with the law of our mind, that the things that we want to do, we don't do, and the things that we don't want to do, that is what we do. Until that time when the Lord comes and He gives us a glorified body. He changes us. And now we are completely new. Glorified. And I think... Maybe if we think about that in a similar way, that the, the millennial kingdom is, yes, the earth has been redeemed. He's now not under the, the, the rulership of man, but under the rulership of Christ. And there's tremendous changes like uh, that's taking place. But it's still not the new heavens and the new earth as what it will be for the eternal state. And right at the end, it's almost like the heavens and the earth will get a glorified heaven and the earth. But during that period of time, it will be new, but still remnant of the fall present. All of that to say is, is this is a great place to be. You want to be here. None of us want to, want to suffer God's wrath, God's anger. We want to be here. And that means we need to bow. We need to humble ourselves daily. It starts with us humbling ourselves before Christ, receiving Him as our Lord and Savior, confessing our sins, saying with God, yes, I am guilty. I am a sinner. I deserve your wrath. I deserve nothing but wrath. But Lord, you, you say whoever calls on your name, and who, whoever confesses Christ with his mouth and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Lord, I believe that. And when you do, you become part of his kingdom. You have humbled yourself before him. And now it's a matter of continually, ongoingly, habitually, characteristically continuing to bow yourself Humble yourself before the Lord. And those who don't, we need to, you, need, you need to ask yourself, have I truly bowed? Have I truly yielded? Do I truly believe? And as we do and as we humble, the Lord is transforming ourselves more into the image of Christ until the day when he will make us completely new, glorify our bodies. God answered Israel, I am not silent. I'm judging those who oppose me.
even those who, who, ha- who are humbling themselves before the Lord, what about them when they are suffering and, and hurting? Well, the Lord used that to sanctify us. Will I continue humbling myself before him when I don't get to say the last word, when I don't win the argument, when I'm not one up to those around me, when people reject me, people oppose me, people ridicule me, will I still humble myself before him? And when we do, he promises us a kingdom, a future kingdom of righteousness of justice, of prosperity, of peace. But for those who refuse, there is a stark warning that the God of truth is also the God of wrath. And so this morning, you know your heart, the Spirit of God knows your heart. You know if there's areas that you need to humble yourself before him. And let the words of Hebrews encourage us. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. As in the day of trial in wilderness, when your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, but they did not know my ways. And as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let us be found humble before the Lord. Because the Lord resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, and we rejoice. What well, just in the, in the knowledge that you are faithful, in the knowledge that you are truth, in the knowledge that you are just and righteous. Lord, in the knowledge that you know all things and see all things. Lord, you know us. You know our hearts. I pray that for those among us, Lord, who confess you with our mouth, Lord, even as we read this morning in 1 John, if we claim that we know Jesus and does not walk in his ways, we lie. I pray, Father, that you would open our hearts to the truth through your spirit, minister to us, convict us where conviction is required. But Lord, build us up, encourage us, strengthen us, Lord, so that we would humble ourselves before you. That we would humble ourselves by preferring you, preferring others. That we would consider others more important than ourselves. That we would not only look out for our own interests, but the interests of others. That would be like Christ, who, who being found in the, in the form of a servant, Lord, humbled himself to death. To death on a cross. Lord, help us that nothing would dissuade us from humbling ourselves before you in obedience to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.